Good afternoon, everybody. Let's go ahead and get started. I'm Bobby Chesney, a professor here at the University of Texas and director of the Robert Strauss Center for International Security and Law, and also affiliated with the Clement Center for National Security. In a moment, I'll be joined by my friend and colleague, Dr. Will Inboden, who's the executive director of the Clement Center, also affiliated with the Strauss Center. Uh, the Strauss and Clement Centers do a lot of activities in collaboration with one another, bringing the world of national security and foreign relations here to Austin and, and helping to project our students into careers and experiences in that field in Washington and elsewhere. Uh, today we have, a, we have a very special visitor. We're very excited to present to you today Congressman Mac Thornberry. He's a key figure in Congress on the issues that, that matter especially to us. He's currently the ranking member of the House Armed Services Committee, or, or HASC as it's known. Uh, of course, HASC oversees budget and policy for the Pentagon, the military services, all the DOD agencies. Um, it's, it's a critical committee. Before his uh, current time as ranking member, he was the chair of the committee for a four-year period. It's first Texan to hold the distinction of chairing that, that important uh, congressional committee. Represents the 13th, 13th district. If you don't know your districts by number, I'll tell you that's the Panhandle and across the northern swath of the state, uh, otherwise known as the uh, the wall that separates us from uh, Oklahoma. So that's the 13th district's core function. He's got a deep family. Sorry, I love Oklahoma. I just like to you know, have fun. There's a big game this weekend. It's got me in the spirit of things. Um, the uh, family roots for the Thornberrys go way back, as old as the university, the 1880s, a ranching family there. And it makes me wonder if uh, when they do the Texas show down in Paladura Canyon, whether there's not some, uh, some Thornberry uh, family members represented in that somehow. If you haven't seen the Texas show in Paladura Canyon, you are missing out. Uh, for many years, he's really distinguished himself as, as a true thought leader in Congress and for the nation. Uh, among many other things, uh, just about every important question, no matter how down in the weeds, about uh, the, Depart the Defense Department's evolution, whether it's uh, organization, acquisition, weapon systems, he's at the center of, of smart thinking on these issues. Uh, but he's also central to the, the broader sort of separation of powers themed question of the role of Congress in overseeing, overseeing some of the most interesting and, and challenging aspects of our national security activities. Uh, he's played a really quiet but critical role in updating the legal architecture of oversight, which we'll talk about in a moment, uh, relating to counterterrorism operations and operations in the cyber domain. And it's really important stuff, even if the public doesn't hear about it. Um, I think his greatest achievement, of course, is he's a graduate of the University of Texas School of Law. So, Hokum, we're really proud to have you as one of our graduates, and we're glad you're back here, and we're so glad you brought with you uh, Sally, your amazing wife, and we're so glad you're here, Sally. So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome up to the front uh, both Dr. Inboden and Congressman Max Thornberry. do a, a conversation style here. Bobby and I have a number of uh, questions we want to interrogate. Uh, so, um, but we'll follow do the interrogation in accordance with the Geneva Convention. Uh, and I should also mention, in addition to my role with the uh, Clement Center, I'm the Editor-in-Chief of the Texas National Security Review, and we are recording this uh, conversation for our Horns of a Dilemma podcast. So hello to all of our Horns of a Dilemma podcast listeners. It's great to have you with us as we get a, another year of programming underway. Um, so I'll start with the first question. Uh, Congressman, this came up in your discussion with our students a little bit earlier. You're a devoted reader of history. Uh, you gave a great uh, proclamation to the students about the importance of reading history, reading history books, even in this era of uh, the blogs and, and shorter attention spans. And I know you've got a particular interest in the life of uh, Winston Churchill. Um, so tell us a little bit, how does your sense of history shape your approach to national security legislating and, and policy making in, in the current environment? Well, actually, a uh, lot of attention the past week over Secretary Jim Mattis's new memoirs. I think he put it the best. Uh, none of us, whatever we've done, have the personal experience that can sustain us for what we're going through. So we have to read about other experiences and, and other things. And, and he, he talks specifically about ways where studying a particular battle or a particular time in history help give him new insights or, or encouraging ways to deal with problems. But part of the rest of the story is, 
how are you going to deal with a problem in the Middle East if you don't know the context, the history, how things came to be? Um, and, 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 and frankly, for me, a lot of it's uh, inspirational, too. It's, well, okay, if he can go through that, I can darn sure deal with whatever's in, in front of me. So, and, and, and the other thing, I, I, I can't uh, give you the specifics on this, but I just saw some articles about what it means physically or physiologically to your brain to sit down and read a book for 30 minutes versus what it means to go through food and stuff. So there's all sorts of benefits. I am very much on the mat of school. It is essential, especially in national security, but I think it's true for everybody. Let me just ask a follow-up on that, particularly on Churchill, because I know you're, even, you're a member of the Churchill Society. You've read quite a bit on him, including the recent uh, blockbuster, Andrew Roberts biography. What can we learn from Churchill for our, our current moment here in the early 21st century? Well, I, I would say, number one, I bristle when people use Churchill for current debates and disputes. So you've got both sides of the Brexit debate who are quoting Churchill, using him as an example. I think that is a misuse of history. He was a unique individual for his time. We should learn and study and be inspired by him. But to try to take a sentence out of the 1940s and say, see, here's the answer for the 2000 uh, teens, I think, is, is, is a mistake. But, but for, for me, one of the uh, key things about Churchill is all the ups and downs of his life. Uh, he he you know, was uh, politically written off time after time, the lonely voice in the wilderness, as it's called, uh, about the rise of Hitler. So sometimes if you think it's you're right, it's okay to be alone, rather than the kind of group think that tends to, to follow us these days. There's all sorts of things we can learn. His, his book on the Malakan Field Force, his first book about the tribes in Afghanistan, for, for many of the commanders was still required reading as we were involved in military conflict in, in Afghanistan, for example. So there, there's the history element, there's the personal inspirational element, but don't misuse it, or anybody, or Lincoln, or anybody else that you love to read about. So in my opening remarks, I mentioned the, the work you've done in revising and modernizing the oversight framework. And when we talk about oversight frameworks for national security, most people think immediately of the House and Senate Intelligence Committees and the oversight of covert action, where you've, since the 70s, had to have a presidential written finding, it's got to be provided to Congress. And, and the, the, if there is magic in this, it's this creation of a sense that someone's got to know what you're doing that's going to cause you to perhaps police your own decision making better. Um, at some point in the post 9 11 period, a number of people in Congress, but I feel that you were the leader on this, began to feel that some of the activities that hadn't been conducted by CIA would have gone through that process. Analogous things perhaps were being conducted by special operations uh, forces and others. And uh, Congress eventually adapted the sensitive military operations oversight architecture. What, what drew you to think that there was a need for change to, to enhance and formalize the uh, oversight that the armed services committees had over that kind of activity that led to that legislation. Well, I, I think you're right that in the past we tend to th have thought this is a CIA mission, this is a DOD mission, but what we evolved to in dealing with the terrorism threat around the world was uh, uh, all of these agencies working more closely together, and they were more effective when they did. <coughs> Uh, but if, if I'm going to be true to my constitutional responsibilities uh, uh, on national security, then I, I've got to uh, conduct oversight even of those kind of merged activities. And we, you know, we're, we're really good about, or, or better about following the construction of military equipment and personnel policies and so forth. But this was a different area that we didn't really have a mechanism to deal with. And, and so uh, the, the thought was uh, have a, a mechanism to conduct oversight so they know somebody's watching, like you say, but also not make it so burdensome that it, that it makes it impossible to carry out operations. Um, and, and so we developed this, the framework of uh, authorities ahead of time, 48-hour notice when there's a kill capture operation outside of a declared war zone. Because if, if you were doing it in the midst of the Iraq or Afghanistan, you'd be doing it you know, all the time. That was not fair. 
but outside of a clear word zone, 48 hour notice that something happened, and then a follow up uh, so that you can get more of the details of the operation. Um, and it's been a struggle because uh, DOD doesn't really like uh, some, this, this, some sort of oversight. Uh, and then, but, but I think it's worked well, uh, not perfectly, but it's been a good start for how we do our oversight uh, with a national security issue that is not limited geographically. It's all over the world. Uh, and, and some of it are very discreet, specific operations for a known terrorist, for example. But, but uh, I, I think it worked pretty well. Then we tried to take that framework for an even more challenging uh, area in that cycle. Um, so it literally, obviously, happens at the speed of light. How do we in Congress oversee a military operation that's occurring in cyberspace? Well, we tried to use the same sort of framework, give us the authorities and, and kind of what's your plan ahead of time, uh, and then have regular follow-ups for, okay, uh, what were the major operations that Cyber Command conducted during this period of time? Again, it's not perfect, but it had, so far is a pretty good start to help <coughs> us as representatives of the American people conduct the oversight over sensitive operations that you can't talk about publicly, but still, you got to have oversight of So, Congressman, you've been a uh, strong proponent of uh, maintaining adequate uh, levels of defense spending. And I, of course, you know, there's a lot of meaning in that word adequate there. Uh, critics, skeptics of the defense budget will point to things like America's deficit and debt, or the comparison between what we spend and either our allies not spend enough, or what uh, even, even the adversary nation, nations do. Um, uh, as you're making the case to the American people for uh, the need to spend enough on defense, how should we assess how much is enough? Uh, what, are, what are the measurements we're, we're using there? As, you, as you're sitting there as chairman and ranking member, uh, you know, governing this, uh, what are the, the metrics, the assessments you're using on what's enough to spend the best? Well, I, I guess I'd, I'd start with basics. Uh, number one, what do we expect the military to do? And, and then number two, if we're going to send men and women out on a mission risking their lives, they deserve to have the best equipment, the best training, the best support that this nation can provide. And if we're not giving them that, we're not spending enough. I mean, it's, it's pure and simple. Uh, most people don't realize that from starting in 2010, the defense budget was cut about 20% in real terms. Now, the world did not get 20% safer over that period. Uh, but, and so we did not ask less of the people who served in the military, but we certainly gave them less. And so we ended up uh, with accident rates that were going up to very high levels. We had the terrible, not only airplanes falling out of the sky, we had the terrible uh, accidents in the Pacific where we lost all those sailors because you literally had a guy who was assigned to a station on, on a destroyer and he didn't know, he hadn't been trained on how to run the console in front of him. Uh, so, because they were so stressed and didn't have, have the time. So, to me, number one is we got to do right by the people who are out there risking their lives. Just a couple of facts. Uh, right now, we spend 15, 1-5% of the federal budget on defense. Most people don't have a clue. In John Kennedy's era, it was 50%. We're spending 15% of the federal budget. If you measure it by gross domestic product, of per person, other than a couple years right before 9-11 were the lowest it's ever been, right now. So uh, if you, you know, there, there's lots of concern about deficit and there should be. 70% of the federal budget is mandatory spending and interest. Uh, again, 15% is, is defense. Um, last point, there's some really good work going on now to more accurately assess how much the Russians and the Chinese and others are spending. They don't pay people, you know, they, they have all sorts of hidden uh, benefits. I think as some of the work, at least, is showing that we're pretty close to the Chinese if you try to measure apples to apples. And, and so I think that work is helpful to get a little deeper than the published government statistics coming out of Beijing. I've often reminded my classes when we you know, think about defense spending that back when Eisenhower was you know, warning about the military industrial complex, uh, we were spending about you know, 14, 15% of our GDP on defense instead of about three, three and a half minutes now. So, um, yeah. 
In about 12 days, it'll be the 18th anniversary when Congress passed the authorization for use of military force mm -hmm. back in 2001. And the President is authorized by Congress to use uh, all necessary and appropriate <laughs> forces he determines is necessary uh, in relation to, paraphrasing a bit, uh, respond to and prevent further attacks from those who carried out the 9 11 attacks, so Al Qaeda, and any who may be harboring them, and at least at the time, uh, uh, the Afghan Taliban. Um, there have been a number of rounds of what we might call flirtation with reforming it, getting legislation out there, a number of bills have come out there, um, but it hasn't happened yet. It's a pretty remarkable period of time. Is it actually a problem that we haven't either uh, reformed or updated or put at least a fresh stamp of approval from Congress on the AOMF? And, and if it is, why, why isn't it happening? Uh, yes, it's a problem. And, and at least in two ways it's a problem. One is, as I mentioned, we have, Congress has specific responsibilities in the Constitution, um, including to declare war. It doesn't have to be called a declaratory, it can be an authorization for use of military force. We have specific responsibilities. Um, and when we don't fulfill those responsibilities, when instead you have administration after administration going through the courts to, to interpret uh, what was done 18 years ago, uh, it's a, uh, it, it diminishes Congress's role and, and is contrary to the way the Constitution was set up. Secondly, uh, if you're out there on a hill in Afghanistan, you need to know that the whole country is behind you. And with Congress as the representative of the American people, not stepping up and saying, uh, Maybe a better example would be if you're uh, on a hill in Syria right now. ISIS uh, is there, a re still there, a real threat. If, if Congress is not willing to step up and say, you have the backing of the American people on this mission, I don't think we're doing right by the men and women who are serving. So I, th I think there's a harm, at least in, in two ways, by not updating what we did in, in 2001. So why it didn't happen? We tried. We tried. Uh, as a matter of fact, a couple years, 2011 and 12, we did, as part of the Defense Authorization Bill, modify the authorization for the use of military force to include associated forces. We couldn't get the Senate to go along. Uh, when Paul Ryan became Speaker, he asked me to uh, work informally to try to see if there could be an agreement to update the AUMF. Uh, and I couldn't get Republicans to agree on how to do it because they didn't trust Obama. Now you've got Democrats who have trouble trusting Trump. So you're in this back and forth where partisanship in a way is overriding the concern about the two problems I mentioned at the beginning. And uh, I you know, I worry about it. I think the American people believe we should be fighting ISIS and Al-Qaeda hadn't gone away and, and so forth. Uh, but uh, it hadn't happened. Uh, I hope something changes because it needs, it needs to. So in our uh, current political environment, there's uh, a lot of skepticism about America's allies and our alliances. Uh, so what do you say to those, to your fellow Americans, who question the value of our allies, especially those who probably aren't spending enough on their own defense? I mean, are our allies at the end of the day, are they primarily assets for our country, or are they free-riding liabilities? <laughs> of course they're assets. Uh, uh, <laughs> Chairman, I hope you say that. The Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, uh, General Dunford, says we've got two things that are the key military advantages uh, versus anybody else in the world. One is the ability to project power anywhere in the world. Although, I will say, with the, what the Russians and the Chinese are doing with hypersonics, that may be diminishing. Number two is alliances. Uh, there are, uh, Russia has no alliances. China. Uh, really doesn't have alliances. They've got a couple countries around them that are scared of them, uh, but they don't have allies who are drawn to their values and, and want to work in concert with them. Uh, it is absolutely true that uh, our allies, especially some of our NATO allies, uh, need to step up and do more. Now, I mean, historically, we can understand Germany, for example, given what they've been through, uh, that it's a challenge for them. But, but, and the same is true with, with, with Japan, although I think I have great admiration 
for the way uh, Prime Minister Abe in recent years has pulled his country to do more uh, and to spend more. And, I, and so, you know, they're on the right track. And I, I think calling out some of these allies uh, that we're there to protect you, you need to do more is, is the right thing. But we should never uh, let the tail wag the dog here. Having allies around the world is a key asset for us. Uh, um, just on a practical level, it means we don't have to do everything. Uh, and, and I think we are moving increasingly to a situation where allies can be given discrete uh, missions that contribute to overall security. So uh, when you put the pieces together, it really is greater than, than the sum of the parts. And, and so I think that's, that's good. But, but again, we should never uh, lose sight of the fact that one of the key advantages we have to maintain our way of life here at home and, and our security here at home is a network of allies and, and partners, not all of them want to be called allies, they, some of them want to be called partners, are around the world that help us and, and share our values and perspectives. One of the most interesting institutional innovations within the DOD realm in, in recent years has been the uh, creation and then evolution, maturation of cyber command, a unified combatant command focused on military operations in the cyber domain, um, incubated very very cleverly by, by having it kind of grow from within NSA, being able to draw on NSA, um, shall we say, uh, resources. Uh, and, and as part of that, dual heading the director of NSA to also be the combatant commander for cybercom. So the dual hat arrangements been sort of the, the symbol of that conjoining of the institutions all this time. For a long time, people have, people have just taken it for granted and have assumed that sooner or later we would see separation, and indeed the, the president has referred to it, there's been much talk about it. Most people don't appreciate that in the NDAA, the Armed Services Committees have required that before that can happen, the Secretary of Defense must be able to certify in writing that operational effectiveness won't be lost, and certain other, certain other very smart safeguards are going to just precipitously separate perhaps unwisely, these organizations. And now you're beginning to hear talk about maybe we've accidentally stumbled upon a really great hybrid model that's not like something other, organiza other organizations have had. Um, do you have any current views on dual hat separation that you can share with us, or can you just talk about what, the, what we might see in that space in the, in the near future? Yeah, I, I think you describe the evolution of thinking pretty well. Uh, the assumption was, okay, we're going to stand this deal up. Uh, we can't, it can't, it's not mature enough to stand on its own, so we're going to nest it in here, and then, but then someday it will go its own way. But as uh, things have evolved, there's more question about whether it really makes sense to go its own way. And, and I don't know, I'm trying, I try to think of an analogy on, on this. It's kind of like, uh, do you really want to be in a situation where you've got a bunch of ground guys going over the hill, they see an enemy, uh, but then they have to bring in another unit to, to uh, attack the enemy? Uh, it's hard to bifurcate the gathering of intelligence uh, about an adversary and, and on one hand, and on the other hand, what you do about it. Um, so, uh, and, and to be blunt, part of the reluctance has been we don't want to pay to duplicate the computer systems and all that you have to, have to duplicate to have NSA over here, CyberCom over here. Um, it's not just, by the way, the stuff, it's the people. Uh, now, sometimes you have to move hats, okay, here you're operating under Title 50 authorities, here you're operating under Title 10 authorities, um, but, but, but I think there's some pretty good evidence that that, that that has been okay so far. Now, yeah. maybe someday we, we will evolve to a different point. But when it comes to the challenges before us now, whether it's going after terrorists, trying to prevent the Russians from messing with the next election, or whatever it is, um, I think this arrangement where there's different authority, they've got a lawyer, you'll be happy about this, there'll be a lawyer by their side to make sure that you know everything is just right every step of the way, but, uh, but, but ha sharing the expertise, facilities, and, and infrastructure seems to be working okay. We're training up the next generation of those lawyers. Yeah, 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 that's a break up. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh,
Congressman, I know that uh, as part of your visit here in Austin, you visited Army Futures Command yesterday, not, not the first time you've been there. Um, but uh, 20 years ago, before the 9-11 attacks, the revolution in military affairs was all the rage in thinking. And we were saying that you know, disruptive technologies, uh, autonomous weapon systems are going to render large conventional forces more or less obsolete. But after 9-11 and Iraq and Afghanistan, we saw that there, there still is a role for large conventional forces, especially against adversaries using you know, some more you know, primitive weapons and, and tactics. But now again, these days, we're hearing about uh, maybe a new revolution in military affairs. You know, our mutual friend Chris Rose has a fascinating article in Foreign Affairs about uh, you know, autonomous weapon systems, AI, disruptive uh, technology being the future of warfare. And, and he, he may well be right. I, I, um, but do you agree? Is the RMA real this time? Or are we maybe lurching too much into this technological future without realizing the, the need for more traditional conventional forces, too? You know, there's some advantage to have been around a while because I remember what you were talking about. And when it became fashionable, uh, the, the, the other term that was used in addition to real, uh, revolution military affairs was transformation. And so everything the Pentagon did had a label slapped on it that it was transformational. Now they may have been planning it for 30 years, but it was still transformational because it became the, the, top, you know, the, the, the label uh, that was the hot topic. Um, I, I think two things. One is there is no question that warfare is changing rapidly. And part of those changes involve uh, artificial intelligence, autonomous systems, robotics. Um, part of that warfare, by the way, involves information in a way that never has before, uh, some things that are really challenging for us. Uh, but warfare is changing, and one of the reasons Army Futures Command is so important is because a lot of the innovation that occurs in our country occurs in the private sector, including small entrepreneurs who, who uh, will, will come up with some idea. And there has to be a way for DOD and the government to take advantage of that innovation. And, and so to have Army Futures Command uh, here where there is a high-tech community, where you have academia of the first quality, as well as close proximity to military bases uh, around is, is a unique opportunity. But I think it would be a mistake to say, okay, this is the only thing we have to worry about because there's still that guy on the ground people stuff that 9-11 reminded us of. Um, and, and, and I think, you know, for years this country was able to focus on the Soviet Union and nuclear weapons and all the competition and so and so forth. Um, and, and so now people say, okay, is China the new Soviet Union or, or whatnot? I think the unique thing about national security in the time we live is that we have to worry about the whole spectrum of things, from very high-end hypersonics, directed energy, and counter space activities, to, to the terrorists who is uh, planning to strap a bomb around him and go blow himself up or, or drive a bus against, you know, into a crowd of people on the sidewalk. Because uh, the American people expect us to deal with that too. So it's this whole spectrum of things that the military has to pre prepare for. Cyber to, you know, very human inter interaction. Part, and, and that gets back to part of your question before on, on military spending. If we could only worry about one problem, then yeah, you know, we wouldn't have to spend as much. But then we would have this whole other set of problems that we were ignoring, and the American people don't want us, don't, they expect to be protected against the whole spectrum. In the, uh, in the 1950s, the Eisenhower administration, President Eisenhower himself, convened a, uh, a, a much studied and admired strategic uh, options vetting process known as the Solarian process, uh, thinking about strategy, towards, strategy options towards the Soviet Union and the Cold War. Um, We've now got something similar underway with respect to uh, the cyber domain in particular, the Cyber Solarium Commission. But this time it didn't come out of the executive branch. It was Congress that called for the creation of this. Um, why did Congress think it was important to, to create such an enterprise? And what is, what is the larger purpose? Should, should the people here care about what the Cyber Solarium Commission does? Well, only if you use cyber or the internet any time in your life should you care about uh, where this is where this is headed. Because again, we saw uh, in the 2016 election one example 
of how uh, foreign adversaries see our dependence on cyber as a potential vulnerability. And, and so we have enormous question, policy questions. We've got the best people, the best technology, no question. What we don't have are the policies about what the government, especially the government's role in defending the country uh, in cyberspace. What's the government's role in defending your email account or a particular business? Uh, we have not sorted through those questions. I don't know that one commission is going to answer all the tough questions before us, but we need serious, thoughtful uh, kind of study on some of these challenges because you know, y'all seen you can have a privacy scare. You think the government's reading all your emails to grandma, and and so you start saying, I don't want the government to touch any of this stuff. Well, if the government doesn't touch it, then other governments are going to have free reign. Uh, because only our government has the tools and, and expertise to deal with uh, top-rated peer adversaries in, in this in this space. Can I just, but to back up for just a second, I, I think you're right. A, a lot of folks uh, have looked at Eisenhower Solarium Commission as as a as a good model. We have, we do have, and I, I think we ought to give them a little credit, maybe more than a little. Uh, it, uh, Secretary Mattis insisted on having a strategy, a national security strategy, a defense strategy under it. Uh, we in Congress set up an outside group of people to critique that strategy so that as we make budget decisions and look at what we face in the future, it would be within a framework rather than just kind of an ad hoc sort, sort of thing. Now again, I'm not going to oversell this, that we've got uh, the right strategy to take us into the 2020s and so forth. But, but at least there's a little bit greater recognition of that strategic thinking and making choices is part of what we need to do more of in national security. And, and so the, the whole solarium uh, model is is a helpful one i think to kind of focus us a little more rather than just okay i built this in my district we need more of it or you know some of the other ways that decisions are made well no, I, underneath that so if you go from the, the national security strategy to the dod strategy there's the national cyber strategy yeah. and then beneath that you can get down to the commander's vision statement from general nakasone who's the combatant commander for cyber command but also director of nsa and there you'll find some very interesting things it's a public document worth going to read um, a, a more assertive posture for cyber command and defending, so-called defending forward outside our own networks uh, in the face of at least threats on the scale of what we saw in the election interference. Yeah, and, and, and that is, we have to be more assertive, I think. But, but, but the rest of the story is, goes back to your previous question, Congress on a bipartisan basis has to oversee this assertiveness because it is possible something could go wrong and, and then the tendency would be to say, oh, the military's gone political and, you know, well, they, they're rogue elephants, all this stuff. Congress needs to be involved as the representatives of the American people on a bipartisan basis. And I've really been preaching to Cyber Command that you need to give us, on a, again, House, Senate, Republican, Democrat, visibility of what, what you're doing in planning to defend the 2020 election so that however it comes out at the end there is no allegation that the military was trying to shape it one way or another you need to give complete visibility keep the military out of politics but you still have to defend the country and obviously these are kind of dicey sorts of issues but uh, but but the answer is not oh it's, it's too dicey we can't deal with it we've, we've got to be assertive I want to come back to what you were bringing up earlier about the national security strategy and the national defense strategy, um, both of which the big theme of is we are in a new era of great power competition with Russia and especially China being the principal adversaries. Uh, so do, you, do you agree? Uh, and if so, is our current force posture matched to, to that challenge? Uh, of course I agree. And of course we don't have the forces to deal with uh, that challenge. I mean, if, if you just look at uh, the geography of the Pacific. Uh, you know, one of the examples I think we can say is uh, the Chinese have systematically been taking these reefs around the South China Sea, dredging them up, making military bases out of them, and, and in effect, 
making the South China Sea a Chinese-controlled lake. So what do we do? Every once in a while, we'll send a Navy ship through there and, and try to reaffirm the principle of international navigation. But we don't have enough ships to do it very often. And, and, and so we don't have, and so, if you're some of the other countries in the region, and you're looking about who's there all the time versus who comes through occasionally, then you're going to make calculations about what's in your national interest. So, so that sort of great power competition is occurring. We need to have a more force structure just to be present, uh, much less to make help the Chinese think twice about uh, taking s some further aggressive action. And, and of course, it's not just the Chinese, although I do think that over the long run, particularly, they're the most formidable adversary that we face. Can I ask a follow-up question on that? Because, especially because you mentioned the Navy not, not having enough ships, I certainly agree. Um, one area of traditional American asymmetric naval strength has been our aircraft carriers, especially, you know, especially when you build a carrier battle group around that. Like, you know, Russia has one, China has one, it doesn't seem to work too well. We've got uh, 11, I think it is. Um, but there have been, for decades, there have been skeptics about the aircraft carriers, essentially saying they're, they're obsolete, they're sitting ducks, especially uh, virtually with China's growing military force. Um, what's in this era? <laughs> It's my handler in Beijing. Uh, uh, so, in this uh, in this area of, of difficult trade-offs and uh, and lim limited budgets, what is the future of the aircraft carrier? Should we be building more or fewer? Uh, it, air, well, they they serve a very vital role. Think of a floating base that enables us to project power to just about anywhere in the world. Uh, but they also are a tremendous vulnerability. The Chinese have designed missiles specifically to take down <coughs> our aircraft carriers, and we're talking about 5,000 folks uh, on, on an aircraft carrier. So, you know, the analogy that pops into my mind is, and we, we've heard this probably overused, it's like changing the engine on an aircraft in flight. You know, you can't stop and say, suspended in midair, and say, okay, we we're going to move away from aircraft carriers, we're going to move to all these smaller ships, because you've got to keep doing the job as you go along. But, 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 and so you've got to keep the plane flying. But, but we do have to evolve, and I think autonomous, more smaller autonomous ships, and aircraft, and land vehicles is clearly the way of the future. Among other things, you reduce the uh, vulnerability of human life. Uh, to, to be in there. But we're not going to say, okay, that's the last aircraft carrier we're going to move away because they are a critical instrument. I, mean, I think it's significant, by the way, that uh, this spring was in April when uh, Iran started their, you know, bomb this or mine that in the, in the uh, Persian Gulf. It was a time when we did not have an aircraft carrier. For years, we would have one there constantly. One would leave, one would rotate out. We don't have enough to do that anymore. So there was a gap, and it was during that gap period that Iran started uh, that provocation in, in, in the springtime. So, yeah, it matters to have one there now. Uh, but at the same time, they're a vulnerability. We've got to recognize uh, Chinese are taking specific steps to attack that vulnerability. We should probably have done to the audience pretty shortly, but uh, I wanted to squeeze in just one more question from my side. I'll do, the I'll do one more, and then and, and the audience get ready with your questions. So, right. so it's your early warning. Um, I, I was just thinking about something you said earlier. We were talking about counterterrorism and the CIA activities, Title 50 activities, and the Title 10 activities. And it made me think about something that was in the news recently because someone wrote an article, I think it was in the Small Wars Journal, reviving an idea that was basically the one big recommendation from the 9 11 Commission report that didn't get acted on or, or was not accepted. That, and I know the Bush administration thought very carefully about it and made a very considered judgment not to do it. And that was the idea that all the, if you will, paramilitary activities that, that the CIA might engage in as a Title 50 covered action should just be, that should be taken out of CIA and have special operations do all of that. Um, so someone recently got a lot of attention for reviving that idea saying, hey, we need, we need to do that. We need to get CIA out of that business. It, it raises a larger question about how much activity will there even be in this space in the years ahead. I think a lot of people 
field it with the return of great power competition, somehow counterterrorism then voluntarily left the stage. And then the threat of terrorism voluntarily went away. And after all, the Islamic State's territorial caliphate was at least largely eroded, so maybe that's the case. But this leads to two questions. One, just a big picture question about have we taken our eye off the ball of counterterrorism? And to the extent that we should not do that, or maybe have not done that, uh, is there anything to this idea that, that the kinetic aspect should be exclusively a function of military operators? Uh, we have not taken our eye off the counterterrorism threat, and we better not, because the terrorists haven't let up on, on the threat. In, in some ways, it, because it has diversified in more geographic areas, it's more challenging for us to deal with. Come for Africa, Iraq, Syria, uh, Afghanistan. They say there's something like 20 different identifiable terrorist organizations still operating there. Southeast Asia. I mean, it's it's, it's around the world. So what we have done is that we are uh, maintaining pressure with very few people, some special people, as it were. Uh, but um, but we are maintaining pressure in, in a variety of ways. But 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 there's no question. You know, to take one simple example, we have fewer ISR, intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance aircraft available for the counterterrorism mission because now we've got, we're worrying about uh, uh, Iran, North Korea, China, Russia, other, other sorts of threats. Um, but, but, but it's still a struggle because, as, as y'all keep po pointing out, we are in a period of great power competition, but uh, the terrorist threat hadn't gone away, so there is this struggle over resources that is that is I, I'm not a fan of saying, okay, CIA needs to completely get out of this business uh, because there are clearly some partners who are willing to do business with the CIA under a covert action because by very definition, there is deniability about it. Now, DOD doesn't have to go advertising everything they're doing around the world. Sure, but still, it's a somewhat of a different kettle of fish, especially in their eyes. So, uh, and, and I guess the other thing I would say is uh, covert actions and, and some of that sort of capability is not just applicable to counterterrorism. It can be applicable to other missions as well. And uh, if you look at especially the Chinese, but also to some extent Russians and others, they have this whole toolbox of uh, capability available to them to advance their national interests. I'm not saying we ought to be, you know, we ought to imitate them. We'll never be that sort of authoritarian state. But we need a full range of tools to apply to particular situations as they arise. And generally, I am against limiting the toolbox. I'm for more tools. So you may not have to use them, but you ought to have them available so that as the situation arises, we've got them. with appropriate oversight, which gets back to what we were talking about a while ago. Uh, so as, as you point out, the intelligence committees in both the House and the Senate conduct oversight over uh, the intelligence community and especially including uh, any covert action that the CIA may, may perform. Uh, now, it's also true that on the Armed Services Committee, we conduct oversight over the DOD uh, intelligence activities. Not as much sources and methods, but the, but the organizations and their missions and, and also uh, their objectives. So, uh, and it's really important for Congress to do that. Let's give a pivot to my last question before we'll turn it over to the audience, which is the, the role of Congress. So when most people think of national security, they immediately think of the executive branch domain, you know, the, the military, the National Security Council, NSC. Uh, what can you tell us about perhaps the underappreciated but still important role of Congress in national security, especially defense policy? And then um, are there any particular former members of Congress, uh, the current ones, I guess, who were load stars for you as leaders on, leaders on this, ones that you looked at as role models? Uh, well, again, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of basic, but the Const Article 1, Section 8 says it's Congress's job to raise and support, provide and maintain, uh, make the rules and regulations for the military forces of, of the United States. And um, it, that's our job. We're interested in what the generals and the uh, Pentagon wants to buy, but, but the Constitution says that's our job. And, and as I mentioned, uh, 
Congress is the representatives of the American people on these difficult, complex, sometimes sensitive issues. And, and on their behalf, we've got to step up and, and, and do our job. There was, there was a report uh, a number of years ago, uh, CSIS put out. Uh, I think the title was Beyond Goldwater Nichols. And one of the criticisms of Congress was that when we deal with national security, we get down in the weeds too much and battle all the majors and, and leave unexamined kind of the bigger uh, policy questions that the American people expect us to oversee. Now, I think we're doing a little better now. Cyber, since the military operations, or some examples uh, 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 of, of that. But, but still, uh, if we don't, the press provides a certain degree of oversight, which is healthy. But so much of national security is necessarily classified that if we don't provide the oversight, ask the questions, uh, then it just doesn't, doesn't get done as much. Um, and, and so we've got to fulfill that, that responsibility. Uh, I don't know. I, uh, a, a number of people over the years, uh, I think, provide good examples. Uh, <laughs> You and I were talking earlier about Senator Sam Nunn and others. Uh, I think the, the, the finding, one of the key characteristics of American national security policy since into World War II has been, it really wasn't partisan. There were Republicans and Democrat presidents, Republicans and Democrat congresses that have followed a, a, a largely similar sort of thrust. Now there were little variations here and there. Uh, but that, I think, has been one of our strengths. And what worries me these days is in both parties, you have debates going on about uh, whether that should be continued or whether we should withdraw, become more isolationist, weaken our military, et cetera. And, and I worry about that. Uh, it's, it's the people who, who, who uh, try to do the right thing regardless of party, I think, that we all look up to. All right, let's hear questions from the audience. Uh, Larry O'Brien, I'm looking at you. This feels oh, and uh, sorry, here comes a microphone if you don't wouldn't mind. So that, like, that like. uh, this builds directly off the dialogue that you just had with Will. Uh, bipartisanship in D.C. is in short supply. So for national security and defense policy, how do you address that in Congress and specifically in your committee? Um, we're trying to do our best. <laughs> I, 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 I'm, I'm worried about it too, especially now. Uh, if you look at the last um, 25 years, the period of time I've been in Congress, uh, we, we fought about taxes, we fought about health care, but when it comes to national security, support of the military, it's been, there's been largely agreement. Now there have been fights about the Patriot Act and different things over time, but, but largely, uh, we've been able to come together. 58 straight years, we have passed a defense authorization act that has been signed into law by the president. This year, uh, for the first time, uh, there was not a single Republican who voted for the defense authorization act that came out of the House because, in my view, and apparently all other Republicans, it was it did more damage to the military and national security than it helped. So I hope that that was an aberration, that uh, in the conference period, which is where we are right now with negotiating with the Senate, and they passed their bill like 92 to 7 or something, uh, that we can be a lot more like their bill and less like ours. And so that this uh, tradition, history, imperative of coming together on national security will continue. Um, but I can't tell you today how that's going to go. Uh, I don't know the answer, and and I do worry about it. Yes, right there, behind there. Yes. Yes, thank you. Oh, sorry. Wait for the mic, please. Yeah. Thank you, Congressman. And you can probably ask this question better than I can, and hopefully answer it. Last year, the Pentagon conducted an internal audit, first time ever, after resisting the mandate to do so for a few decades. Found a lot of problems, and I guess the answer, uh, the question is. What is, is the House doing oversight of what those problems are, of, of lost money, of lost assets? Uh, is there corrective asset action going on? When is the next audit going to take place? And maybe you can ask a better question than that. Um, no, it's, it's, it's a great point, because uh, we were talking earlier about how much we spend on defense. 
Uh, it is, it's the largest employer in the country, the Department of Defense is. A massive amount of money uh, goes through there. Uh, and, and obviously, when you're dealing with that many people, that much money, not all of it is going to be spent exactly the right way. And so, as you point out, several years ago, I forgot the exact year, we put a, a provision in law that says there will be an audit of the Pentagon. And they didn't want to do it. Well, we, this IT system can't talk to that one and, and, and so forth. Then we, we really put the deadline, you will conduct an audit no matter what in uh, last fiscal year. And we said, it will happen, whether you like it or not. And, and to his credit, now the Deputy Secretary uh, of Defense, who was the comptroller, uh, David Norquist, conducted the audit. Everybody knew the first audit was going to be ugly because they'd never done one before. Uh, and, and by ugly, I don't mean, and, and I think people misunderstand this, it's not that there's a bunch of money wasted or, you know, lining people's pockets or something. It is, an audit is about being able to trace a transaction and say, okay, the books say you're supposed to have five of these on the shelf, show me the five. Well, it turns out one of them has already been spent, sent to troops on station somewhere, you know, that sort of thing. It's, it's to have the traceability for money and stuff that uh, the Pentagon has. And there were a number of problems that were found as expected. So the benefit of that is it gives uh, Norquist now the deputy and all the services specific problems to go fix. And we have had hearing after briefing, after hearing after briefing, on how are you doing on fixing those problems. And they're doing another audit this year, and another one next year. They have to do it every year. Uh, will they ever get to a perfect audit? I doubt it. It's too big. You know, there's too much human error. So rather than have you know everything exactly on the shelf where it should be, uh, there will be something missing that was misplaced or whatever. So we'll never be perfect, but there is a degree of accountability that comes with it, and I think a degree of public confidence that comes with it that makes it essential that we continue. We had testimony, by the way, by one guy who uh, used to work at DOD uh, who said it's not worth the, uh, the results of the audit are not worth the money it costs to do the audit. And, and maybe in a strictly dollars and cents way that there's truth in that, but I think from an, from confidence of the American people aspect, we got to do it. We're going to continue to do it, and we'll keep solving problems. That's that's the way these things go. Thank you. Um, I'm curious. You guys talked about the increased use of autonomous vehicles in our national defense, particularly um, those that are weaponized, and obviously there was a lot of. Uh, because it's a new technology, there isn't very much legal precedent out there in the books until Obama finally put out the playbook in 20, uh, summer 2016. What do you think Congress's role should be in both regulating that, its use, and uh, and mapping its future? Because we're not the only ones with this technology anymore. Yeah, no, it, great point. Uh, I think it's kind of like we were talking about cyber. We, Congress, if we fulfill our job under the Constitution, we're the representatives of the American people. And that means the conflicting values that come in with something like autonomous vehicles have to be debated and hashed out and it's going to be messy, but, but that's what needs to happen in Congress. And, and then we give the policy parameters to the Department of Defense. Okay, you can have autonomous vehicles that do that. You cannot have autonomous vehicles that do this. I mean, that's the way it should work. Um, and uh, so I, I think you're, especially with uh, uh, autonomous firing uh, weapons, uh, there's enormous ethical issues there. Uh, I'm not sure we will or should ever go exactly down that road, but then you do get the problem that you mentioned, and that is look at what the other guys are doing. And in some way, you can have a salvo of missiles coming at you where no human can move fast enough to shoot down the missiles, and so some degree of autonomy, at least for defensive purposes, uh, may be required if you're going to really prevent uh, uh, a lot of uh, folks from being hurt. Uh, so, 
the, the real answer to your question is we've got to step up to the responsibility that only Congress is, is able to exercise, whether it's autonomous vehicles, whether it's cyber policy. We, we, we've got to do a better job. Now, I'm not saying we've done very well, by the way, in, in stepping up to that responsibility in the past. It's sometimes easier to duck tough votes than to study an issue and, and, and take a hard a position knowing you will be criticized for it. But, but I don't see any other way when we get to some of the implications of AI and, 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 and robotics and autonomous vehicles. I don't see any other way than hashing that out as much as we can in public uh, and, and giving them the policy parameters to DOD and the other government agencies. I was wondering how you, as an elected leader, mitigate the challenge of representing Americans on foreign policy and military issues, given that so few Americans really understand, take interest in understanding foreign policy issues, or um, are receiving information that may or may not be correct. One of my jobs as a leader is to help uh, educate, help people understand issues that they may, that may not be readily apparent. So, uh, in my case, I represent a congressional district that is bigger than 13 states, largely rural parts of Texas uh, from just outside the FW, uh, you know, to all through the panhandle. Uh, agriculture is the biggest industry in my district. So one of the things I do is I remind people that about a third of everything we produce in agriculture in this country is exported. So if you're going to export it, you got to have trade agreements. You got to have free uh, international shipping shipping lanes that are protected. So there is a connection to into other countries and the rest of the world that affects the pocketbooks, not just of the farmers and ranchers, but the bankers and the store. You know, everybody who's there. I think that's part of my job to help people understand. I'm amazed, I, I gotta tell you, I'll go through a number of businesses in Amarillo, Texas, and I'll ask them, what percentage of what you make do you export? It's, it's more than you ever think. But most people don't have the insight that I get to have by going to these different businesses, so my job is to go talk to people about that. Uh, so I think part of what we need, expect our elected officials to do is help put things in context. and and. This is a, a pet issue of mine. Uh, we, we all get buzzed constantly in our pockets and purses about the news of the moment. What, what we don't have and have a harder time than ever doing is putting the news of the moment in a broader context or seeing the bigger picture. And, and part of the bigger picture is that the constituents in my area are more dependent on foreign trade and, and what happens around the world, then they realize. And, and so if I can help provide that context, I think that's, that's part of my job. And that's just one example of where putting things in context, the importance of the internet, uh, you know, uh, uh, and, and so forth. Uh, I think that's what we got to do. Uh, Professor, are you here? Uh, the mic's coming on down, Sam. Jehan is moving with dispatch. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I'm really excited when uh, you're going to be actually interested in the industry, so well, thank you for being here. So my question is actually about foreign policy. Uh, how do you see the uh, Saudi Monarchy uh, coalition war in Yemen and the American involvement in that question? Thank you. Uh, it is one of the issues that we are grappling with in the conference committee between the House and the Senate on the Defense Authorization Bill because there were a number of provisions that were added uh, that uh, say what we can and cannot do. Uh, not just with regard to Yemen, but generally with regard to our relationship with the Saudis. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of worried that uh, the, the narrative has uh, gotten away from the truth a bit. Uh, Human rights uh, and, and humanitarian catastrophes in Yemen, no question. Uh, but the idea that because we occasionally refuel a Saudi plane, we are the cause of that catastrophe, I think, does not put things in context, to go back to what we were just talking about. 
um, and, and, uh, and the Iranian involvement uh, in, in supplying weapons to the Houthis, all, all of the different uh, aspects, which I'm sure you're aware, uh, make this messy, uh, but just because it's messy does not mean we wash our hands and say, okay, whatever happens, happens. You know, just one brief example. Obviously, there's a lot of shipping that goes around the coast of Yemen, and if uh, the Houthis or anyone else can threaten that shipping with uh, with missiles, as they have uh, done a bit of, then it has worldwide implications. It, it's not just us. So, uh, you know, one other point that comes up on this: the uh, we struggle with this when it comes to human rights more generally. Because there is, are, are one uh, uh, aspect of thought that says they don't follow our values on human rights, we should stay away from them and not touch them. The other uh, train of thought is we need to engage and improve their human rights record. And, and you know, I acknowledge that it's, it, all situations are not necessarily either or, it's not a binary choice, but I tend to believe that our influence is a beneficial influence and so being engaged with partners around the world who may not and often don't share all of our values is a beneficial thing for the longer term of human rights uh, and also can be in our strategic interest. We had uh, debates for years about whether we should take uh, military officers from Central and South American countries, bring them here, do training for them here in the United States, and, and send them back. Some people we shouldn't do that because there have been terrible human rights abuses over the past in country X, Y, or Z. Well, we're not going to make it better by staying away and giving them a lecture. We've got to engage. And, and there's other examples uh, of uh, restrictions on, on some of our military training in Africa and elsewhere that I'm not sure we're, we're, we're doing it exactly right. Engagement, I think, is good. We need to stay true to our values and help influence other people in that direction. It's right here, right in front. Theo is going on I'd like to ask you a question about cross-fertilization in different domains in Congress, general committees. Mm -hmm. uh, you have noted that China is an adversary, perhaps, our future adversary, uh, leading adversary. Um, we also have our economic interests, which are very closely connected to our security interests. Uh, and we have something called the Trans-Pacific Partnership. To what degree does the committee, uh, which is a, a security or a forces committee, uh, talk with other representatives of Congress to point out that having Malaysia uh, Singapore, Vietnam, of course, Australia, Japan, together with us in a Trans-Pacific Partnership, would reinforce these other security interests to our benefit. Some, but not enough. I think it. Uh, we may look well look back on our failure to participate in the Trans-Pacific Partnership as one of the biggest strategic mistakes we have made in recent years. Um, and, and by the way, both President Trump and Secretary Clinton were against it. So they were both uh, on, on the same side, and, and that side is wrong, in, in my opinion. Um, not, and I'm not even talking about the economic benefits. Obviously, I, my, farm, my ranchers can sell a lot more beef to Asia if we were part of it. But, but geostrategically, I think it was a, uh, is a mistake. And so I, I think you, your, your larger point is exactly right. In Congress, especially in the House, uh, we tend to focus on one or maybe two committees. And that's not the way problems present them, issues present themselves in the world today. And, and especially if you look at what China is doing, they're using all the instruments of national power, not just of government power, but of national power. As you mentioned, economic uh, and, and diplomatic, they send students over here to learn things. They, they send investors here to, in my view, uh, confiscate our intellectual property. They, 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 they steal things off the internet. They, they do all of these things for a national purpose. And we can't get one department to talk to the other department when it comes to, to the federal government. So Congress is part of the problem. Uh, 
you know, we, we still operate under a committee structure, but, well, one more example, back to cyber for just a second. Uh, when he was speaker, uh, John Boehner asked me to chair a task force on cyber, looking at the way ahead. And, and he wanted a representative from every committee that would be affected. We had nine committees represented on that task force because it was such a cross-cutting thing. Uh, we did, were able to come up with some recommendations and then the Snowden and WikiLeaks and all that happened and all fell apart. Nobody wanted to do anything because they were af afraid of government snooping. But, but we got to figure out some way to cut across these different domains uh, to advance the national interest. And, 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 and no place needs that more than probably than Congress does. This will be our last question. Um, Dr. Kaplan over there. Did Jayhan, if you can bring it over to Dr. Uh, recently, I read an article about the uh, ISIS wives and children that are encamped in Iraq. The 50,000 kids that are being radicalized as we speak. And so that is a future tremendous danger for us. And so my question is, is Congress addressing that? Uh, or they're leading into the curves to just manage the camps? Because when these kids grow up, they're going to be the future ISIS fighters that we've just recently, would say, beaten. We've destroyed the camp, but they're still there. Uh, I don't know if I'm supposed to say this or not, but I guess I will. Uh, the, the commander of our central command told me recently that this is the problem in his command that worries him the most. Uh, and part of the reason I think it worries him the most is, okay, what do we do about it? Uh, so it, there's been some articles, as you mentioned recently in the press, about this very large camp. Uh, we're not there, uh, but it's where a lot of the ISIS uh, five families have uh, been uh, put into, and the, uh, the the attitudes there, the radicalization there, and and the what that portends for the future, because it's in this case largely women and children, uh, is a very daunting problem. So I, I guess the answer to your question is we're aware of it. We we get intelligence briefings on it, and. I don't know what we do about it. Um, now, part, I, I, will, I will say this, part of what we do need to do is consult with our allies and partners in the region about uh, the way forward. One of the problems is especially European nations have refused to take their people back. And, and so, what do you do except you try to keep them confined? But then you have all these families. What do you do with them? Where do you send them? How do you de-radicalize? You know, with all the work that's happened after 9-11, I don't think anybody has found the magic key of de-radicalization yet, uh, which obviously is a very complicated thing. So, big problem, but I don't know what the answer is. Thank you.